Hey guys, welcome back to my uh, Lost in Space robot build. This is part two. This is my second video, so if you watched the first one, you know we were talking about the basic design concept that we we're going to do and the things we kind of wanted to accomplish. Uh, today, we are in the proof of concept phase. So what this is, is actually building and programming uh, some of the code to actually prove out that uh, what I thought was actually going to happen will happen and um, This is our uh, proof of concept board. So what we've done here basically is we create a box and we just put some plastic on top This is like plastic you use for yard signs just something to mount stuff in and basically uh, I mounted all the components on here that would normally be inside the robot for this portion of the build This is not everything but portion of it and our main like object here was to see if we could get all this programming done um, using an Xbox 360 wireless controller as our control. So this is a gaming controller for the Xbox 360 video game system. Um, but we want to try to use the commands coming out of here through our microprocessor to control all the stuff that we want to do on the robot. So, uh, this system was sort of developed by uh, a couple other people. It's out on the uh, internet and it's called the Padawan 360 system, which is, uh, you know, referencing Star Wars. And it was originally designed for the R2-D2 Robot Builders Club. And um, there's code out there that goes with it uh, that was written by, I believe, um, the current code was was modified by Dan Krause, and the the original code for the I think Sony PS2 was by somebody named Dan F. I'm not sure who that is, but anyway, uh, kudos to them because they started the whole uh, process and they wrote some of the original code. And um, we are going to be modifying that code, however, because it doesn't really fit our B9 robot as opposed to the R2-D2 robot since they're two different types of robots. Some stuff is similar and the same and other stuff isn't. But uh, we have a lot of plans that we're going to do. And what we're using for this is the Arduino uh, system. So Arduino is an open source system where um, they create these microcontroller boards that you can then upload code to which is written in sort of a, a C, C++ language and uh, use that code to control whatever you want, right, with those Arduino boards. So it's pretty robust and it's open source and there's tons of information on the internet plus forums that will help you with all kinds of stuff. So anyway, that's what we're going to use for at least this portion. Uh, we did buy the Easy Robot so um, modules and software too, which we're also going to get into, but for now, for the basic control system of the treads, which is what we're after since we're starting from the bottom, we want to get this functioning and, and make sure it works. And this is what we're doing today. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to break this video up uh, so that if you don't want to watch the whole thing, uh, you don't have to because there's a lot of information to cover. But I'm just going to walk through first the basic uh, setup here that you're seeing. Then we're going to do a, a demo. And then after the demo, we'll get into... Uh, some troubleshooting steps, things I ran into when I was building it. And then also we'll just take a quick look at the um, Arduino sketch that goes with this. Um, and so let's get started. All right, so what do we got here? So basically uh, in the background here we have a Meanwell 12-volt uh, power supply. This is being this is plugged up, you can see over there, into the uh, power outlet from the house current. And it switches AC to DC current, and it's up to 29 amps output, so pretty powerful power supply. Uh, that power supply is feeding these two uh, power blocks here. There's one for the positive, one for the negative. And um, then we have a master switch here, uh, which is controlling, which is switched on the DC output here. And it also is uh, has a voltmeter, so we can keep track of how many volts are going to these power blocks, basically. Um, here we have two motors. Now these are not going to be the motors we're going to use in the treads, uh, but these are two motors I had just for testing purposes. I drew an arrow uh, going around in a circle so you can see the directions uh, when we start doing our demo. But, um, you know, really we're using bigger wheelchair motors for the tread section to be able to pull that kind of weight that we're going to have when the robot's finally finished. So, But these are good test motors to test with. 
over here we have this is uh, called a saber tooth motor controller. It's by a company called Dimension Engineering, and this is a two thirty two. So it's a two motor controller up to thirty two amps each motor. So plenty of power on this one. And then uh, here this is also by Dimension Engineering. This is they call it a Siren S Y R E N uh, motor controller. Um, and this is a 10 amp on this particular case. It controls just one motor. Um, and that, uh, that this one controls this motor over here, which is gonna be the motor in the radar section. This one controls both of the tread section motors. Uh, then we have this uh, SparkFun MP3 trigger board. Uh, so this is gonna trigger all the sounds coming out of it. Uh, then from the trigger board goes to a, a ground loop isolator. So we put this in here because of all the everything that's going on to eliminate any static noise. And then we come into our audio amplifier right here. And then our audio amplifier uh, feeds our two speakers. These are 8 ohm speakers. Um, uh, I forget how many watts they are, but they're pretty powerful. And they're nice and small uh, speakers in their in size too. So they're not gigantic, but they got tons of sound and they sound great. Um, so this is by a company called Drock, the amplifier and the speakers. You can find it on Amazon, but awesome uh, components. Um, and then we also have the, uh, Microsoft receiver. So this is the Xbox 360 controller receiver, which plugs into this board here. That is, let me zoom in a little bit here so you can see this a little better. adjusted okay so this board on the bottom here is called a Arduino Uno so it's uh, the microcontroller board this is where all the code is loaded onto to run all the different commands and then plugging on top of that board is what we call a USB shield so shields are just boards that plug into other boards on top of the Arduino and this board's purpose is to provide a USB input into the Arduino, which is what it's doing. So when the Xbox 360 wireless controller, if I can show it right here, I'm zoomed in, but if when the Xbox controller sends a command to the receiver, it will send that through the USB shield down to the Arduino. So then the Arduino will uh, use it within the code and then run whatever the commands are. Um, uh, so we, we, we got this all working. We did have some issues that we had to work through and uh, I'll get to those in the troubleshooting section. But those are our main components that we have here. And of course, underneath the box here, there's all kinds of wiring running back and forth. I, I ran it through. This actually, this, this uh, um, Siren 10 motor driver just actually came today. I actually shot the video and then I didn't have it and then I just added it in real quick so the wiring is kind of sloppy right now. It's on top. But anyway, this is our setup. So what we're trying to do is prove that we can use the Xbox 360 controller to do everything we want to do on the B9. Now, we're not finished. We haven't done everything, but we've done some of the major things and it's looking pretty promising. So let's uh, get into the actual demo. Okay, so uh, the first thing you want to do is uh, you want to power up your uh, 360 transmitter. And that's just the home button in the center here. You just push it and then it'll start blinking. The blinking on and off like that basically means it hasn't connected to the receiver yet. Uh, which it, of course, hasn't because as you can see over here, the receiver doesn't have the light on yet. Right? So um, we haven't powered up the system. So back here we have a power switch here and we're just gonna turn it on. We'll get voltage reading right here on this display so we can see how much voltage is coming uh, to these power banks. Now, the voltage is not what's coming out of here, it's what's getting to the power bank, so uh, on the DC output, basically. And then what'll happen is uh, the little lights on all these boards will go on saying they're powered up. And what should happen is then, in a couple of seconds, the uh, receiver should light up and then connect with the controller and what will happen is we should hear a sound and then these flashing lights will turn into a single solid light on one of the corners here. So let's uh, 
Let me pull this back here a little bit. Make sure we can see everything. Okay, so we have this here. So I'm just gonna sort of leave this right here, maybe at that, and we're gonna turn it on. It's gonna take a second. Main computer boot sequence completed. So basically the robot says main computer boot sequence completed and we're getting a bunch of, of uh, instead of the blinking lights, the, it's spinning around the home button now. So we got four segments spinning around the home button and everything is powered on. So let's start with the most important thing, which is really what I was after, which is the motor drive, because that's the section I'm starting my build on, the tread section. So uh, the way this works is I'm using the left stick here to drive the motors. And you can see right now I'm moving it and nothing's happening over there on the, the actual uh, motors themselves. So actually, let me zoom in a little bit so you can see it. You're going to need to see those arrows there on the top of the hubs. Okay, and so now what we're going to do is we're actually going to hit this start button right here on the controller, which is right here. And when I hit that, it's going to play a sound to let me know that I have now been activated the drive mode. I am completely mobile. Okay, so now we're mobile. So now if I touch the joystick here, basically what should happen is the motors should move, right? So if I move the joystick, you can see the motors are moving there. If I push it the other direction, they're going reverse. If I push it to the right, you can see they're going in the opposite directions, which would be a turn. And then left, now we're backwards in the opposite direction, okay? And also, if I move the joystick sort of like diagonally or just move it around as a thing, you'll watch the motors there. They'll change different speeds on each motor depending. So you can see right now in this position, only the one is turning and the other one's static. Right? So you basically have full control with the joystick. And you could really almost, you should have pretty fine control over the robot when he's moving. And then also, you'd be able to make him spin in circles if you wanted to or whatever you wanted to do. Now, that's the lowest speed mode, which is the first segment right here. If I push on the joystick, swell, it gives me a, another saying that tells me I'm in the second drive speed. And if you look at the motors, you'll see they're going a little faster. And if you listen to the sound too. Okay, if I hit the uh, joystick, push it again, now I'm in careful mode, which means I'm getting a little faster. And then one more time, I have a four speed control. Wow. I'm in wow mode, so now I'm really cooking. Now you have to remember that these motors that I'm using right here are geared uh, down and they only go so many RPMs, no matter how much power you put into them. Uh, but that's not gonna be the case with my wheelchair motors, which are you know, motors that are used uh, obviously in wheelchairs that can push a lot of weight, two to 300 pounds. So they should be pretty powerful and I should have a lot of fine control with the speed controls. And if I push it again, okay. it goes back to okay, which basically means that I'm at the lowest speed again. Now, if I push the start button again, please stand by. It goes into standby mode and if you look now, my joystick is dead, right? I don't have to worry about the robot taking off. The other thing is in the code, it has some lines in it that uh, protect you. So if for some reason you were in a drive mode and you walked far enough away and or whatever happened, you had some interference and the controller loses connectivity with the receiver, the system will automatically go to zero drive speed and stop. So that's kind of nice. All right. So that's the motor and the drive speed. Super happy about that. Even if I only had that, it'd be worth it because uh, now I have total control and I don't have to have a big RC controller or anything like that. No. All right, now, second thing. This motor, uh, oh, let me get zoom back out here. So we got this motor over here as our uh, test example right here. And this motor right here uh, would be a motor that I would use, say, in the radar section. So I just put a piece of tape with a plus sign so you could see it work. But the way this motor works is this one is going to be off the right joystick right here, 
when I move it left and right. So if I move it left, you can see my radar section is turning and then opposite direction. So this joystick controls this motor. I could have another one that goes off the up and down if I wanted to on the joystick also. Um, so that's a possibility. There's also the four buttons right here, the thumb pad. I have four directions there. So I've got a couple of choices for more stuff. Waist turn, bubble up and down, things like that. They all have to be programmed, but it's I, I can't see why it wouldn't be doable uh, from what I've been experiencing with the code. Now, I'm new to Arduino and C, C++ code, so you know I'm struggling with it, but I'm getting there slowly as I do more research research and learn it. So we're getting there. Um, but anyway, all right. So the next thing I want to talk about um, is the sounds. All right. So you, you heard a couple sounds when I'm pushing some of these buttons already, but you can also hard code sounds in the system using different combinations. So these four buttons over here, X, Y, B, and A um, are good ones for that. And then there's also these buttons on the top. You have these rear uh, buttons and these front buttons right here. So what's nice about these is for each of these buttons right here, you can do combination. So the code is written in a way that uh, if you hold this button down and then hit the A button, you'll play one track. If you hold this button down and hit the A, you play a different track and vice versa. So you can get four uh, tracks hard coded to each button. And then on top of that, uh, by using a random command, um, it will, uh, without the buttons in the back, when you hit the button by itself, play a bunch of random tracks that you've selected. So you can put the range in of how many tracks you want to use for that random button. And the thing about it is, is remember I told you that the uh, Spark Fun is only up to 255 tracks, but that's still a lot of tracks. So you could put like, you know, <clears throat> Even if you put up, you know, like, I don't know, 30, 40 tracks per button, that'd be enough for randoms, right? So you can group them different ways. So uh, just for testing purposes, I grouped them. Uh, I just did the Y and the A button right here for right now. A is basically music. So I programmed everything to be under A as music, like the theme to the TV show, uh, different music that would be in the show. And then the Y I programmed for robot talking. Uh, for different things, but you can program them all the way, you know, different ways that you want to. So let's just give a demo of that. So I'm going to hold the back, uh, well, actually, I'm going to do the first, the top one here, the front one, and then press the A button. So you can see that's the uh, season one theme. Active. I'm just hitting this uh, button right here just quickly to uh, kill the MP3. Uh, but normally that track would just run out uh, to the, to its end. So if I hit the second one over here, so that was season one, right? If I hit the second one over here, then it's going to be um, an A. Please stand by. Okay, so that's again basically another combination on A. And then I can go in the back here and do the same thing on the back button, hit A. Oops, can't see that, sorry. So it's the back button down here and then A. I don't know if anybody remembers this episode. Active. So you'll have to remember a little, little uh, trivia quiz here, what episode that was from. And here's another one from another episode that uh, most of you probably remember. Okay, so you can see I programmed those four to the A, but if I don't push those buttons down and I just hit A by itself. If I hit it again. Active. So basically every time you hit the button, it'll go to the next, ra it'll randomly select a track based on the uh, range that you indicated in the code, uh, and we'll talk about how how you how you designate that on the Sparkfun board when we get to the troubleshooting section. 
You probably also notice that while we're going through this, this little motor right here um, has been uh, sort of like uh, moving by itself every once in a while. And that's because uh, it's in uh, this, this back button right here, uh, right here to the left of the home button. If you turn it to active, please stand by. It's off right now. So if I turn it to active, active. Okay. This is uh, what this is uh, automation mode. So what it'll do is um, uh, automatically, you can see the motor just move by itself. I didn't touch anything on the pad here. So it's basically doing random movements and you can also put sounds in there. So random movements and sounds sort of to make it autonomous. Like if you had it at a show and you just wanted to do stuff by itself, you could make it do it by turning into the automatic mode. You can disable automatic mode Please stand by. I go into this please stand by and then it won't uh, move anymore. So that's another feature that you uh, can do with that. The other thing is, uh, let's go to the Y button now. Let's do the same thing. So these are not music. These are different, right? So I put different groups under this one. So I'm going to go to the back button here and then the Y. At exactly launch plus eight hours. Inertial guidance system. Destroy active. Okay, so that was one. The front one. Why did the robot cross the road? Because he was carbon bonded to the chicken. <laughs> All right, and then the back button with the Y. Hands off the neon, my friend. And the front button with the Y. Do you have any WD-40? But if I just do the Y by itself, no buttons. May I be excused? My power pack needs charging. Building a B9 robot. Bubble, $300. Torso, $1,000. Laser cut steel tread sections, $1,200. Having me standing in your living room, priceless. That's always a funny one. Uh, but basically, so you'll be able to program these four and any button hard-coded and then you can do randoms on the by the, just the button themselves now I haven't actually tried this but I'm going to try to uh, uh, change the programming to uh, not change add to the programming so that if I hold down both buttons on one side and I push the button do I get another uh, option right can I do another track or something so the great thing about the Xbox controls, you have all these buttons here, and they're basically all just, every time you hit one, it's putting a signal out right to the receiver over there. And um, if you write the code correctly, you should be able to capture these signals and then make it do whatever you want it to do. So I think that's kind of cool. I really like this because it's so small and compact. It's cool looking, goes kind of with the robot. It's just perfect. Um, so, so far, it has worked out. Please stand by. So, I'm disabling the automatic mode so the little motor doesn't run anymore. Um, and then, I, like I said, I haven't even started the thumb pad yet or anything for other things like the waste motor left and right, bubble up and down, things like that. So, this is going to require maybe a little more because the code's going to have to be like enhanced to be able to handle servos. Um, I think I know the commands that are going to come out of here. Uh, I might have to use a serial monitor to see them, but um, basically um, once they come out, if I can link those uh, signals to uh, do something like on the robot, like uh, move a servo, then I could do the, the bubble lift up and down and things like that. But anyway, so that is it. Um, now, the other thing about the 360 controller is um, if you want to shut it off, uh, you got to make sure that you shut it off first before you kill the power to the transmitter because if you don't do that what happens is um, the controller will never shut off no matter what you do except taking the battery out that's it so if you uh, just press the two top buttons and then hit the home it'll shut off the lights go off and you're all set and then you can uh, shut off your power supply but if you um, have your main computer boot sequence completed, have your controller on, and you kill the power to your system, and now the receiver's dead. Uh, you can see it's blinking, waiting for a connection. But if you try to do the buttons, it will never shut off. The only way to get it to shut off is actually to like 
open the battery pack and then put it back in. So just FYI, you'll want to uh, do the shutdown on the controller before you shut your power down to your robot and vice versa. T power up your uh, controller first, then power on your robot so it's ready to go. Uh, I think that's it for this demo section. Uh, as you can see, everything has worked out uh, and working perfectly and I'm really happy with it. In my next video, I'm actually going to be using the full wheelchair motors. I'm going to build like sort of a pseudo tread section out of just plywood, uh, like a flat piece of plywood, mount the motors and the tires and everything, and then, you know, mount this stuff in a way that I can really just sit on it and see if it'll move around and do exactly what I want it to do with the wheelchair motors. The only thing about motors is I'm not an expert in motors as far as their... Uh, volts and um, amps and the size they need to be and also the RPMs right for what I need I'm, I'm sort of guessing but a wheelchair motor obviously uh, moves people around so that's two to three hundred pounds of weight which is about what the robot will probably be so I'm thinking they will be they will work uh, the thing will be just can I uh, get the fine speed control so I definitely want four speeds on it um, and it always depends how those are those motors are geared but the motor controller should be able to uh, control all that stuff. Oh, one other thing. This little motor right here, I think you saw it was like moving oh, kind of fast as it was spinning around, probably faster than the radar section would mo normally move. But uh, you don't need um, a motor a speed controller on this. Um, the code in the Arduino uh, sketch has a space in it where you can put the max RPMs that you want it to go. So I could go into the code, change the max RPMs on this, and it would slow down. Because before, when I first hooked it up, it was spinning around like crazy, and I just cut the uh, value in half, and it slowed it right down. So that's the other nice thing about the code in the sketch, is that you can change values in there. Um, and it eliminates another piece of hardware instead of having like a, a speed controller in between here for whatever reason, right? Now, if you wanted a, um, a motor that was gonna be a constant speed, it was never gonna change. Um, there's nothing wrong with putting a, you know, in between just putting a, a speed controller or something in between it, but any hardware um, that I can save, I'm gonna try to do that. Um, Okay, I think that's it for the demo section. So next we're gonna go on to the uh, troubleshooting section and then just a quick uh, Arduino lesson if you're not familiar with it. I know most of the people out there are probably familiar with it, but if you were brand new like me, just a couple of, of quick things about Arduino code and, and kind of how to handle it as far as just uploading it and uh, getting it to your board and things like that. I had no idea how to do any of it uh, until I took the little course that I the bought and then uh, a lot of information on the internet. So, all right, so stay tuned. All right, let's just talk about a couple of quick gotchas that uh, I kind of struggled with. Took me a little bit long to figure out. I eventually did, but uh, it can save you some time. So first thing is, um, it is recommended by the, the guys on the forums and everything that you buy a genuine Microsoft 360 controller and not one of the knockoffs. You can try a knockoff. It may work just fine. Uh, I decide not to waste my time with all that and I just bought a genuine Microsoft 360. Yes, they're more expensive than the knockoffs, but um, uh, apparently a lot of guys were having problems with disconnects and communication things between the, uh, the controller and the receiver. So... I also bought a genuine Microsoft receiver too, instead of the knockoffs. So, but that's up to you. But just just a tip from uh, what I've read from other people. As far as the audio system goes, zero problems with the audio system. The Drock uh, amplifier and speakers are awesome, so nothing to worry about there. Same thing with the ground loop isolator. Just put one in there. You'll eliminate all your static and everything if you get any uh, feedback or um, interference. The uh, SparkFun uh, MP3 trigger board is, has a couple of gotchas on it that you'll want to be aware of. So first of all, this board, uh, like I said, can only take 255 tracks. Not a big deal, that's still tons of tracks. Um, the th second thing is the SD card that you use in there. So these take these um, micro SD cards 
If you get an SDHC card, this can only go up to 32 gigs. If you have a bigger one, it won't work. It won't read the card correctly and it won't find your MP3 files. And there's a little flashing light that indicates problems if it, if it can't find something. So uh, you might have to get a smaller card because most of the cards that they sell today are pretty big, but um, you'll need at least a maximum 32 gig if you're using the um, SDHC cards. So just keep that in mind. I spent a whole bunch of time trying to figure out why it didn't work and it turned out just to be a stupid card. The other thing about this uh, board is that the way it reads the card is by not the file name of the track. So initially I, I labeled all my you know tracks like 001, 002, 003 to put them all in order. And then I copied them to the board all at once. I just did a, you know, select all and copy them all over. Well, um, I found out, and I didn't know this, but when you copy things over uh, onto a drive, whether it's a drive or, or a card or whatever, that Windows randomly selects the one, the order that it actually copies it over and writes to the drive. Apparently this board is looking at the order that was written to the drive, not the file name. So it has two commands in the instructions. There's a play command and a trigger command. And if you use the play command, it uses the position on the drive, not the file name. Um, and then if you use the trigger command, it uses the actual file name, uh, like 00123, whatever it may be. So keep that in mind because um, once you copy something to a, a drive, unless you copy them one by one, so you know the exact order you copy them in, you may not know because if you did a bulk copy, uh, Windows will still display them on the screen in your alphabetical order, but the problem is that's not the order they were written to the drive, and so your numbers will be off. You'll think you're playing one track and it's actually paying, playing a different one. You won't understand why it's playing the wrong track. Uh, so that's just a gotcha with this board. I want to switch it over to the trigger command, but I I quickly just tried it and it didn't work correctly. Um, I haven't dug into it yet. So, but if I can get the trigger command to work, then you just um, reference the file number. Now, there's a way around this if you just want to just leave it the way it is, use the play command, and that is to get this little program called Drive Sort, which is on the web. It's a free. A uh, little program. It's just an executable. It actually doesn't even install anything on your machine. You just run the executable and it's a simple window where you open up your drive. It will actually show you the real order that it was written to the drive and there's a sort function that you click and it'll sort them uh, like say you number them like I did one two three four five. It'll sort them in order and then when you hit save it will actually save that as the written the way it was written to the drive. And so you definitely want to uh, Get that little program, just grab it off the web, run it through your uh, antivirus to make sure you got a good copy, and then um, you'll be set. And that's all you need. And that way, if you ever want to replace a track, uh, you don't have to worry about deleting them all and copying them over one by one again. You can just put your track in with the right number, let Windows sort it, and then open up the um, uh, little program and then go ahead and see what the real sort is, resort it and save it and you're good to go. So just just little uh, tip there if you wanna, uh, it's a really handy little program. Um, I think that's it for the, uh, the MB3 board. Otherwise it works really well. Oh, no, there is one other thing. I originally had files that were pretty high quality like files. I think it was 320K and I had it at like 48 hertz, whatever it was. But it didn't like those because when it played them, they were all garbled. I think it was too much for it. So I had to basically re, uh, recode the uh, MP3s down to 128. I used 128 and 44.1 hertz and works perfect. And it sounds, it still sounds great. So just FYI, if you're getting garbled MP3s coming through, they're probably too high of a, a quality rate and you just need to bump it down, so. All right, um, next we have these, uh, let's go with the motor controllers here. No problem at all with the Sabertooth motor controllers, zero. You just hook them up and they work. The only thing you have to do on them is set the dip switches for what you need 
and they come with their own little sheet so that you can uh, basically look up uh, what the settings are but it's really just uh, you're gonna use the the packetized cereal settings and um, there's a little chart that shows you exactly what to set so for both of these one and two are off and then all the other ones are on uh, but no problems with those whatsoever and you just hook up the motors to the uh, motor one and motor two um, outputs really what happens here is if your motors are spinning in the wrong direction or one is wrong and one is right then you just switch the wires around on your motor controller and it'll straighten it all out so all right now the last thing was the uh, uno board in this case and then the USB host shield on top so obviously this is the main guts of the system the uno board which runs everything uh, originally I used this board which was a uh, mega uh, 2560 which is what I want to use because it's a little bit more powerful and it has more outputs on it as you can see it's about twice as long here and I was using the host shield that's on top of this one right now and when I got it all set up I was having all kinds of problems the motors wouldn't work sounds were coming out wrong it was just acting all kinds of strange and I couldn't get the uh, the light on the receiver to light up I'd have to unplug it, plug it back in. It was really weird. So I wasn't sure what was going on. I spent a lot of time on it. So uh, what I did is I ordered, uh, or not I ordered, I had an Uno board. So I decided to switch out my Mega board with an Uno, put the host shield on top, and try it and reloaded the uh, sketch that goes with Uno. Everything worked perfectly. Now, I don't know what the actual problem is yet. I haven't dug into it because the mega board is brand new and there should be no problem with it running it. And the other thing is the USB host shield that I got off of Amazon, basically it said it is compatible with a mega board, but it didn't say 100%. It was kind of sketchy. And the problem with these USB host shields is Arduino doesn't make them anymore. They stopped producing them and now you have to buy these aftermarket ones, usually from China. They're all over Amazon and you never know what you're getting. So just be aware that um, you might want to get one from a reliable source that says it actually works with the Mega. This one that I have, I bought a second one right here. I got from a website, uh, uh, Tinker, I forget what it's called, Tinker or something. Uh, but when I this one here in the description was uh, marked for recommended to go with Mega. 2560 not just compatible so my guess was that this USB host shield since it does work on the Uno is not compatible with the mega board but I'm not positive it's one of three things either this board here is not compatible with the mega the mega board has a problem or the sketch code that was uploaded to the mega board has a problem um, but I'm gonna test it out now that I got this second uh, board here. Now the other thing about the USB host shields, if you get the cheap ones off of Amazon, uh, when you get them, what you're gonna find is that there are a couple of uh, terminals that you need to solder in order to make it work. So there's actually three. There's one right here, which is right next to the USB port. It's the five volt. And then there's two down here, which are right next to the uh, black connector. There's a 3.3 and a 5 volt. So what it is, is there are two two little like sort of like terminals that are uh, separated. There's gap in your and You have to bridge them with a dot of solder uh, to make this uh, output get some power. So you got three points if you get the boards that are not soldered already. You got the 5 volt, the 3.3, which are right against the black connector, and then you got the 5 volt, uh, which is next to the USB. You just get a little pencil iron, put a dot of solder across them, and that's it, and you're set to go. This one uh, came already pre-soldered, ready to go. This, this board was probably uh, $10 more than the other one. Um, but it's all ready to go, and it's confirmed for sure to work with the Mega 2560. This one I got off of Amazon back here. These were not soldered originally. I had to solder them. And then, again, it said it was compatible, but it doesn't seem to work. So I will find out <clears throat> because 
I happen to have another Mega 360 board here by a different manufacturer. This was the board that came with my uh, Arduino learning kit. Uh, so I could, um, I brought this kit to learn electronics and Arduino programming. So this is also a Mega 2560. So if this, for whatever reason, still doesn't work correctly, I'm going to try this one and that will tell me if it's the Mega board or if it's the um, um, USB host shield. Um, it could also be the, the actual sketch, the code because the sketch for the Mega is not the same as the sketch for the Uno. Although most of the um, code in there is basically the same. Uh, so, but uh, yeah, so that was the only thing with that. So just keep that in mind when you get your host shields. If you buy the cheaper ones, you're gonna have to do that little solder connection and then you'll be good. Uh, I think that was it for troubleshooting. Um, everything else was, uh, everything else went together pretty well. So. Uh, let's go look at the sketch real quick. Okay, so here's my laptop. You've got to download the Arduino IDE program, which is the program that you do all your sketches in. Uh, so the sketch is the, you know, the code that you're writing for the uh, microcontroller. So you just open it up. It'll always remember your uh, last sketch that you have. And um, this is where you're going to write all your code for everything that you, you uh, want to do inside uh, to control your Arduino, right? So all that code will be in here. The thing about these sketches is that there's always going to be a section um, at the top here to include certain libraries. So you see how it says uh, include Sabertooth, uh, Siren, and stuff like that, right? These libraries uh, come from different places. They come from the manufacturers of the products, like the Dimension Engineering for Sabertooth. They're written by different people, but what, what it is, is these libraries include code already in them that you don't have to write. And all it's saying is include this code in this overall sketch, right, whenever you reference it, so that it knows what to do. So to get this code, this, these codes, though, you have to get this in the system, and you have to do it by adding libraries. So these will be, you know, wherever you're getting your stuff from, these libraries will be out there. And then once you find the library that you're after, right, you can click the install button and it'll install it into your uh, uh, into your system, right? And now you can reference that library and all the code that's in it. So you have to load libraries one by one, uh, as far as I've been able to figure out. Um, and so you just grab all the libraries you need for your particular thing, whatever you're doing, whatever you're getting off the web, and then you can uh, install them one by one. So when you go to uh, tools here, um, uh, where was that? I forget where this was. Um, I think it's, I think it was open. Well, I can't remember where it is, but you guys will, you'll be able to uh, mess around with it and find it. But you basically, you can add your, uh, oh no, it's under sketch. I think it's under sketch and then um, add file. You find your library that you want. I think, I don't remember. I don't think it's under manage libraries. These are the libraries that are already part of the system and then you can install them, but that wasn't it. Um, there's a place where you can pick uh, the library I thought it was under sketch, but oh, here it is. Include library, and then you go to um, add zip library. And when you do that, you can pick your library, and then you click uh, open, and it'll load it into the system. That's it. Sorry about that. Still learning this uh, tool. Um, so you got to make sure you get all your libraries. So when you look at, if you're pulling any code down from the internet and it's referencing these libraries, make sure they're installed on your system or these pieces won't work. Um, so that's the first thing. Then the other thing is you'll, you're going to have to import the main code, right? Which is called your sketch. Um, and then once you open your sketch, you can just go open, right? Open sketch. It'll open up inside the Arduino program. When you're ready to upload it to the board, that's this little upload button. And you just have to make sure that your USB cable from your PC is connected to the 
Uno or your Mega Board or whichever microcontroller board you're using. And then you just hit upload. And when you do that, then you're going to see some stuff at the bottom where it says uh, compiling and then uploading and then upload finished. And if there's any issues with the way you've written your code, then it'll appear in red at the bottom telling you what the, what the problem is. The other thing you want to make sure is when you um, hook up your board and you open this up that you are um, setting it to the right board type. So in this case it's Uno, but I would change it to Mega if I was uploading to the Mega board. And then you're going to have a port. So once you're connected to the board, you'll have a port that, and you want to make sure that's correct. So these two should be identical like in your system once you've uh, set them up the first time. First time you connect, it'll pick a port and that'll be your port for that board type. And you can always click board info if you want to make sure what, how it's connected and what port it's using too. But this will show you the port that you're on. So don't forget to set your board type, put your port, um, and then once you do that, make sure you get all your libraries loaded. Once they're loaded, then you can actually do the upload of your sketch. What's nice about this, is so nice about this, is that all you do is you connect this cable, you upload your sketch, right, and, and then you just disconnect your cable, uh, cycle the power, and you're ready to go. You don't have to wait for a computer to boot up and all this other kind of stuff, right? And then if it didn't work, you come back to your sketch, make modifications to your code, reconnect your cable, do an upload, it's done. And it, the uploads literally take like, I don't even know, 15 seconds or so. I mean, they're really quick. So, um, yeah, so uh, if you go on the uh, Arduino site, it'll have a whole bunch of information. Um, everything is out here. Um, you can go to the community, there's forums, um, there's just so much information, but it's such a neat system, um, that I didn't know about, um, open source and pretty much, uh, everybody's just putting their, uh, information out there for everybody to share and, uh, you can do just so much with it. There's so much to do with all kinds of boards and everything with it. So anyway, um, highly recommended for our project because we're going to have a lot of control over it. Now, I haven't started on using the Easy Robot software, which I also have, um, but um, and I may use both of them in combination, but this is definitely a great uh, application of using the uh, Xbox 360 wireless controller and then uh, being able to control a lot of stuff with our robots. So, All right, I think that's it for this video. Sorry it was so long. But I just wanted to give information out to anybody out there that's starting off and trying to do the same thing and is totally clueless like I was. And then um, the next uh, video, like I said, will be an actual hopefully running video of me uh, being carted around by a, uh, you know, a uh, motorized pseudo tread section to see if it actually works and all this plays out. So again, thanks for watching my videos and we'll see you next time.